Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast that explores Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And as you guys know, Jimmy is uh, hes not on vacation. He's working. He's in Europe. He's doing all kinds of stuff. Very, very busy. Uh, we're going to try and get Jimmy to call in at some point, And so we'll do, uh, we'll do something. We'll have some fun. But in the meantime, um, I am uh, interviewing, hanging out, talking to various people that I know you guys want us to talk to. And today, Today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Matthew Barrett. Uh, Dr. Barrett is the Associate Professor of Christian Theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. You guys know we like that place. He is the founder and executive editor of Credo Magazine, the host of the Credo Podcast, and he is the author of a bunch of books, one of which is Christianity Today's uh, Book of the Year in Theology called Simply Trinity, the Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit. Dr. Barrett, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great to to uh, join you, man. We've uh, we've been having some guys on that we really respect that uh, that teach the truth, but teach it in a way that is comprehensible and compelling. And so, uh, yeah, you were one of the guys. We we're like, man, if we can get him on uh, soon, that would be great. And so, we're <laughs> we're, we're, we're thrilled. We, we we love we love your ministry. We love your teaching. And yeah, big fans of of, of where you're at now. Uh, there at uh, at Midwestern, good stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's exciting to be here. I've been here for five years now, believe mm-hmm. it or not, yeah. and it seems like time is flying. But uh, just love teaching the students here, and uh, love getting to teach systematics. We just actually revamped our PhD in systematic theology, so yeah. I'm can't wait to start that this fall. So great, you know. I I w- we'll we'll talk about seminary in a bit, but um, you know, I I I really enjoyed both Bible college and seminary. I guess I did the double dip, um, and uh, you know, th- systematic theology has always been one of my you know favorite subjects, uh, both you know in school and, and out. I've always really enjoyed and been drawn to systematic theology, and uh, having the right professor in Theo is so important, so critical. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, you might get, like, I've had professors who, you know, had good doctrine, but were really boring. I've had, I've had professors yeah. who were very winsome and energetic, but like, ooh, a little cringy uh, on certain things. So I, I've yeah. had it all. And, uh, or at least I've had a number of versions. Uh, I, I, if I could go, if I'm sending a lot of people uh, to Midwestern these days and really recommending it because uh, the, the faculty just continues to, to grow and mature as the seminary grows and matures. I mean, goodness, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was a different place. Well, not that it was yeah. bad, it was just very different, and it's really, yeah. really coming to its own. Mm. So so true, yeah. And, you know, I, I teach uh, Theology 1, Theology 2 at the master's level uh, every year, and I completely resonate with what you just said. Uh, it's, it's one of those moments where this, you know, these are some of the most important classes you take in seminary, mm. and so trying to provide some deep, Theology, but at the same time, uh, keep the students awake. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So no. I, I try to do both. Yeah, not everybody is as interested in it, right? I mean, some people just have right. affinities for other disciplines, and uh, so I know, I, I, you know, as you know, preachers, you know, especially doctrinal, theologically oriented preachers, run into some of that as well. You know, how do you mm-hmm. move people along? All right, so one of the things, or maybe right now, the the main thing, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the thing that you seem to be you know most known for these days is uh, your teaching on your writing on the doctrine of the Trinity. Is that fair to say? Well, yeah, you know, I've I've written on so many different things, yeah. but I, I keep coming back to the doctrine of the Trinity because this really is, and this is, I'm, I'm also a pastor in the local church, so I, I'm not just saying this as a professor, but mm-hmm. as a pastor, I mean, this is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think as evangelicals today, especially in, in the light of the 20th century, uh, you know, you kind of hinted at this a minute ago. I think you used the word cringy, which I, I need to, that's a, I, that's a good word. I don't know that I've used that word before, but that's 
probably accurate to say, mm. yeah, you know, on the doctrine of God in general, but even uh, specifically on the doctrine of, Trin- of the Trinity, we've been a bit cringy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we have to take an honest look at ourselves. And uh, that really has forced me to say, you know what? I think we could be more faithful to a biblical and orthodox understanding of God. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, you know, I didn't grow up in the church. I never went to church until I was 17. It was the first time I ever walked into a church. And um, and I wasn't a Christian. I was visiting because there was a girl I liked. And um, and I was converted after I graduated from high school. So, um, you know, I, I had really no background. But in God's providence, I just wound up, I read the Bible over and over again because I, I knew nothing. I never read the Bible before. And so I stumbled into you know, Protestant orthodoxy. I was going to a Baptist church, but they, you know, it wasn't a theologically oriented church. But I started reading and I, I read some John MacArthur and that really whet my appetite for, you know, thinking theologically. Uh, but shortly after that, I wound up with uh, Charles Hodge's three-volume systematic theology. I was maybe a mm. two-year-old Christian, you know, uh, 19, 20 year old and yeah. uh and it just set me on a particular course for yeah. for Orthodox, for Protestant, and Reformed uh, theology. Mm-hmm. And so I, I was really fortunate because God just providentially set things up to guide me in a particular direction, and not everybody has that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, like from the, you're talking about cringy, you've got, you know, these overly simplistic, you know, analogies of the Trinity that are cringy, that just like, you know, yeah. that don't work and create problems. And then you've got, these very modern and postmodern concepts of the Trinity that really aren't in line. They aren't, I don't think they're in line with scripture, but they're certainly not in line with, with, you know, classical theism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why, let me ask you this. What is the most common trouble? What is the most, the most common problems that people get into with the doctrine of the Trinity at the lay level, like in the church? Like what's the most, yeah, common hindrance to understanding it because i'll tell you what i hear a lot is from people like well the, yeah it's, yeah anytime the doctrine gets hard they just go well that's just a mystery we're not really meant to understand that you know it's yeah. just we can't really get into it so i think some people just give up but what's the most common problem that people run into in the pews when they're looking at this doctrine well it's really difficult to narrow it down to one but i'll, I'll maybe i can throw one or two at oh, sure. you i think in my experience um, in the church, uh, I've, I've pastored, um, actually, you know, you were talking about seminary, uh, right out of seminary, I pastored and, uh, and then I, I've also taught, but then I've come back to pastoring as well. And I think the, one of the most common mistakes, and sometimes it's innocent enough, and I don't know that we, we realize we're doing this, but we just assume that what it means for, for you and me to be persons mm. uh, is just the same thing as what it means for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be persons. Right. And okay. oftentimes what, what that looks like is it seems, it seems like in a, an innocent move, but it's actually quite dangerous. Uh, what do I mean? Well, oftentimes when we think of you and me or just society, how society works, well, we're persons, but we're, we, you know, you're your own individual. I'm my own individual. You, you have, you know, to use some philosophical language here, you have your own center of consciousness. I have my own. You have your own will. I have my own will. And so best case scenario, we cooperate with one another. You know, if, if you and I were to say, hey, let's plan a church, you know, well, we would need to try to form some unity as brothers and, and cooperate around a whole number of things. And that's great. And, and we even look at broader society that way, right? I mean, we, this is part of the issue right now is we're quite frustrated with society because it's so fragmented and we wish there was more unity. Well, that's all great at a societal level, but the danger comes in when we just assume, oh, that just must be how the Trinity works. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, As if Father, Son, Spirit are their own individuals, with their own wills, their own centers of consciousness, and they get along, and they cooperate with one another, and, and they have a, a type of unity in that way. But actually, historically, um, that's pretty close to what we would call the heresy of tritheism. Right. Um, and, uh, or, or at least, at the very least, it can lead, it opens the door uh, 
so that you, you might be facing that direction. And so what I tell people is don't just assume that, uh, or, or maybe we could put it this way, don't just take a societal view of how persons work or how a community works and just project that back onto God. Uh, he is God and he is, he is, uh, there is none like him. And so we, we want to be really, that's a dangerous move. Uh, and so we, you know, we could talk about this uh, if you want, but when we look at the, the church from the past, going back to some of the most important creeds, like the Nicene Creed, they didn't define the Trinity in that way. In fact, they defined it very differently uh, whenever they were talking either about the unity of the Trinity or what distinguishes the persons. Mm. So personhood is, is and confusion over that in God is maybe one of the, one of the areas where people get yeah. confused just because yeah. well, who teaches on personhood, right? I mean, like, like in your average church, like that's, yeah. <laughs> that's you know, the, you're, I mean, it, it's obviously it's, it's, it's heady. It's philosophical. Um, mm-hmm. It's certainly biblical, but you know, uh, breaking yeah. that down and unpacking that for people is, I think it's fair to say it's pretty uncommon. And so Very. they're kind of left to their own sort of imaginations on who God is. And they're, they're left with, the anthropomorphisms in scripture, uh, you know, where, where God ex- is expressed in ways that we can comprehend and that relate to us. And I, I can see how, you know, people move in that direction. But what's, what's another area? You said there might be a few. So there's confusion over the distinction between God as, you know, in his nature and person and who we are. What's something else? Well, uh, you, you've actually touched on it a little bit, and, and it's this. We are just complete strangers when it comes to not just the biblical language, but uh, the language of Christian orthodoxy and how it has not just confessed the Trinity, but mm. worshipped the Trinity. Yeah. And I think that is, to us, it feels like, oh, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. This is okay. But I think if we were to you know, bring any number of, of generations from the past into the present, they would be, they would be shocked. Um, mm. they, w- they would be maybe uh, quite, <laughs> quite shocked by uh, our, our lack of familiarity um, with just basic language that keeps us from heresy. Mm. So just to give an example here, um, you know, we were, t- we're talking about person. I think oftentimes when we talk about the Trinity, we just assume, oh, well, Father, Son, Spirit, they must be persons like we're persons. Uh, they must be a society like we are a society. And so they just have relationships. Mm-hmm. And so we, we, we immediately start projecting a very psychological, very modern understanding of what is a relationship. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's no wonder then that we go to all kinds of extremes. We, we might, for example, start in, uh, inserting a hierarchy in the Trinity, because isn't right. there a hierarchy in our relationships? Sure. And, and so you see, that's a really dangerous move. Mm. Rather, when we go back and look at both Scripture and um, our Church Fathers, well, we discover something quite different. Um, when they define the persons, they say, well, actually, Scripture puts its finger on, on one thing, and one thing alone to define, define these persons. So, well, what is that? Well, take uh, the Son, for example. Uh, when we open the Gospel of John, how do we see the Son of God described? Well, mm. even the language itself, Son, uh, gives it away. Uh, to be a son is to be from a father, or to use more traditional language, it means to be begotten from your father. But, of course, this is God. This is not like our human experience of begetting. And so, in the Gospel of John, for example, when it describes the only begotten son, um, it it is, of course, drawing your eyes to, you know, maybe you think of that famous passage, John 3.16, Uh, It's drawing your eyes to the gospel, but it's ultimately meant to lift your eyes up heavenward to say, well, if this is the Son who who the Father has sent to save us, who is this Son from eternity? And and that's where we get into uh, our Trinitarian theology, and we confess, well, actually, this is the Son. Uh, He doesn't become Son at the Incarnation. Rather, this is the Son who is begotten from the Father, but from all of eternity, right. and there, there never was a point when the Father was not Father and the Son was not Son. Uh, likewise, we could talk about the Holy Spirit here and, and say, well, the, the Holy Spirit, how, what, why, what distinguishes the Spirit as a person? Well, it's as mysterious as this may be, um, 
it's not that this, this spirit is a second son, for example. Um, mm. Rather, uh, the spirit knows the spirit's not begotten, but the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. Or maybe some of our listeners have hear, heard the language of spirating. This is the spirit that spirated from the father and the son. So the, this language is really foreign to us today, yeah. but I'll just add this. It's not actually as strange to us as we might assume. Uh, as I just mentioned with the Gospel of John, it's actually right there in the back of our minds, and it's, it's popping right out of the text. It's just that we, we're not used to recognizing it. And so our, our theological uh, you know, instincts and taste buds, they have to be reformed in that way. Well, and I think, you know, people see a word like begotten or, you know, whatever in you know, the scripture, like we, most people that read, I think, uh, they, they see where they don't know. They just gloss over it and keep going, you know, and they're That's like, right. well, I get the gist. I know I get the gist of this. And they don't, they don't dive in. They don't look it up. They don't, you know, go get help. And, you know, what you're saying is, I mean, it, it's, I like what you're saying because everything you're saying is the Nicene Creed and the Nicene Creed is a reflection of scripture it's like, you oh, know, absolutely. Why, why? So, I guess one one thought was, you know, when people see father and son, uh, you know, they're not thinking, oh, the son, you know, uh, is begotten, eternally begotten uh, uh, of of the father, and it's speaking of nature, then, right? Like this is, oh, they have the same nature. Um, they're thinking. We tend to think like, oh, father, son. We do think hierarchy. We do think naturally, like, okay, the father is the boss. And the son does what he what he does, and I, so I, I I understand why people would gravitate towards that because that's their experience, and they're mm. not thinking on a deeper level. But be, because you know the creeds, the Catholic creeds are so helpful and so clear. Um, why do you think it is? I mean, you're a Baptist, you're a Southern Baptist. I was I always <laughs> like to tell you know when I'm hanging out with people and I'm meeting people, um, especially non Christians, and they go, "Oh, wait a minute!" They find out I'm a pastor. They're usually like, "Oh, really?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm a pastor." And they're like, "What what what, what kind?" And I say, "Well, uh, I'm a Baptist." And they go, "Get out of here!" And I'm like, "Yeah." Not, and then I say, "Not only that, I'm a Southern Baptist." And they're, oh, they're like, "Because well, I'm mind up, blown." Well, I'm up here in the in the Chicago <laughs> suburbs. And there's you know it's just they're. They're like, really? Okay. So, um, but you're, you're a Southern Baptist, card-carrying Southern Baptist. You, you teach at a yeah. Southern Baptist uh, seminary. Why are our Southern Baptist churches so unfamiliar with the Nicene Creed? Oh, uh, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, for you, man, I got hours. Oh, you know, it's a real, I think it's a question that you're not just asking this. I think a lot of the up and coming generation is asking, why is it that our churches seem so disconnected from the past? And uh, they look around at other denominations and they say, they don't, I mean, sometimes, but they don't necessarily seem to be as disconnected as we are. Right. And so this has been the million dollar question. Um, I mean, I think there's probably a number of reasons why mm -hmm. this has happened. Um, some of them are theological. I think we've made the mistake of assuming that if we believe in the authority of Scripture, that then we have no reason to mm. give credence or, or pay strict attention to the accountability of the creeds and confessions. Like biblicism. But yes, a, a type of biblicism that is, um, I think, uh, quite cancerous because, uh, well, Let's just be honest, uh, if we do some good history here, that is not actually what our Protestant re Reformed uh, fathers meant by right. Sola Scriptura. Uh, they would have been mortified by that. In fact, um, they were quite adamant when they distinguished themselves from certain radicals who said that. Uh, certain radicals who said, you know, let's just get rid of tradition. The church has been lost since the apostles, but guess what? We're here, so good news. <laughs> no, the reformers were, were, were quite embarrassed by that, and they replied to Rome. Rome was accusing them of heresy and innovation, and they said, actually, no, uh, we stand with our, our feet firmly planted, of course, on the authority of Scripture, but the gospel in which uh, Scripture, you know, Scripture gives birth to this gospel. That that's been passed down to us in very faithful ways uh, by the church fathers and even uh, the medieval theologians. And uh, we are 
we are actually being more consistent or more Catholic with a small C, uh, the, the Catholic or universal church, we're being more Catholic than you. Mm. And that, of course, really offended Rome. <laughs> so there's that issue, first of all, that I think we have to really just face up to and, and get over. I think there's also some other issues going on. Um, I mean, you're a pastor in the local church. I think for a long time now, um, and I, I can say this from my experience in Baptist churches in particular, um, our worship, uh, the way we go about worship is far more modern. And uh, one of the results of that is that we seem pretty unfamiliar and disconnected to the liturgies of the past. And uh, I mean, just to, to give an example here, I mean, churches throughout the centuries uh, not only uh, came together to repent and of their sins and, and uh, confess those and receive assurance uh, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they are also quite adamant to recite, say, the Nicene Creed. Yeah. Uh, why did they do that? Well, for one, they wanted uh, to make sure that they were being faithful to uh, the Holy Trinity. And what a better way to do that than to look to one of the, the greatest, maybe the greatest statement in the history of the Church, uh, which so faithfully articulates what Scripture says uh, over against uh, many different heresies. But then also, and this sometimes gets missed, I mean, many of uh, the churches that came before us, they understood when we are doing so. I mean, this isn't just a, you know, a archaic you know, recitation of history, but when they are doing so, they understand we are linking arms. We are linking yeah. arms with brothers and sisters from the past. We're, we're not alone here. Um, and uh, by linking arms with them, we are confessing the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And, and there's a, a great comfort in, in doing that, because I think especially in our modern time, I think younger evangelicals are, are, are desperately uh, hungry for that sort of thing, because in our times, we feel just so disconnected from everything that's come before us. It's, it's unfortunate and, and ironic, I suppose, that, you know, 17th century Baptists went they they went really hard to establish we are not Anabaptist radicals, you know, like they were yeah. they were constantly like no 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 like this is why we this is why we ripped off the, the Westminster and the Savoy. It's like listen, yeah. uh, <laughs> you you need to know that we're not that. We stand yeah. with you in this Orthodox stream, and today. To find, you know, that our, our, our churches and like the Southern Baptist Convention is really a, a derivative of that movement, right? I mean, all of the signers that in 1845 uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention came from churches that embraced the Second London Confession. So mm. it's, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate and sad and ironic that, you know, we're, we're at a place where there has been so much distance Put between us and where we came from, and I don't just mean 1845 because we do need some distance put between us and 1845, if I'm honest. Um, but uh, at least certain aspects of it. But uh, the distance between us and our origins, like our real origins, uh, you know, coming out of the, the Protestant Reformation and the Separatist movement, and uh, to, yeah. to lose that heritage is cl oh, yeah. clearly, you know, taking its toll on on the, the, the strength uh, and the structural integrity, theologically speaking, of our churches. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we, we, we've been talking about the Trinity, but I have another book that's coming out um, in about a year called The Reformation as Renewal, yeah. and... Um, this is the very point I try to make is we need to actually understand what it really means to be Protestant. Um, and you're exactly right. Uh, when you go back in time to the 16th and 17th centuries, that's what we find. We, we find uh, our, our Protestant fathers were uh, quite insistent that no, we are not, we are not radicals um, as much as we might be confused with them. We are not radicals. And so, yeah, it's no surprise then that they, uh, not only, you know, you, you mentioned the particular Baptists of the 17th century, it's not a surprise that um, they are very much aligning themselves uh, with, not that they don't have any differences, but they're mm -hmm. aligning themselves with the tradition of Westminster, Westminster for example, yeah. and the Westminster Confession, and it's not a surprise that their confessional documents look very similar. Um, but this, it's, it's even bigger it's even bigger than Baptist. So I think when you look at the 16th and 17th centuries, what you find is that uh, many of the Protestants, they understood uh, if we are going to show our Catholicity, 
um, then that means uh, also demonstrating how what we teach is consistent, not just with the Church Fathers, but even with um, uh, many of the, the medieval uh, scholastics, uh, as much as they might have disagreed with them on certain issues in soteriology and ecclesiology, they also were, were quite adamant that they were very much in their debt. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 it's. I just it just occurred to me that it's uh, <laughs> this may be a this may be a dumb thought, but it just occurred to me like, while well, the, the the early Baptists right were were like, listen, we're not radical, we're orthodox, we're we're normal. I mean, we're we're different. We have our differences, right? Our covenant theology is a bit different, or you know, our our view of polity or whatever. But um, and, but today, like, boy, people would much rather be radical. I think our I think a lot of our Baptist churches really yeah. like the idea of uniqueness and individuality. And we're yeah. doing our own thing, and we're going our own way. We're going to have our own statement of faith, and we're going to have our own way of doing, you know, mm-hmm. doing worship or whatever. Instead of it being rooted in, you know, in Scripture and in you know, theological tradition. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I think it is becoming more and more apparent that we are really attracted to that very independent, autonomous move, maneuver. And uh, I, I find it scary because uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, and, and history uh, can speak to us here with many examples, oftentimes when that occurs, um, there's simultaneously a, a move away from, from orthodoxy. And I think we've, we, we see that with uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, if we go in that radical direction, this occurred in the 16th century, it, it occurs today. Uh, we begin to drift away from, um, I call it Trinity drift in my book, mm. uh, but we begin to drift away from uh, a biblical and orthodox understanding of the Trinity, um, and that's actually... Um, well, if, if that's the case, then we're actually compromising the essence of Christianity. We think we're actually reforming, but actually uh, we're departing from, uh, from, from true Christianity at that point. I was wondering, it, do, do you, and this is, again, this, some, some of my own thinking here, and please push back on this. I'm wondering what you think. Do you, I guess here's, here's what I'm thinking. Um, it seems to me that another reason why there is uh, a neglect of the creeds, uh, you know, those confessions, uh, is because of bad church history from coming from mm. Baptist whole trail of blood thing, you know, where we avoid the Protestant reformation. I mean, I, when I was in seminary, I heard people at Southern say we aren't Protestant. I heard somebody say that once. Um, mm. and I, I got there, you know, shortly after Moeller got there. So I had I had all great professors, but I heard I did hear some nutty things uh, from time to time, and um, you know I've heard like we're not evangelical, we're Southern Baptist or whatever. But I you know I've heard people say that we're we're not Protestant, we're Baptist, and they they through some really bad church history, they wind up tracing Yikes. themselves all the way back. <laughs> Do you think that bad church history has contributed to you know this uh, this disconnect between what our real heritage is? Oh, 110 percent. Hundred and ten percent. I I completely resonate with with what you just described. Um, I mean, anyone who's grown up in a, a free church environment, um, uh, like I did, uh, I, I can testify that this is no no doubt the case uh, that that biblicism runs deep. Mm. Um, in which you know there may be many great things going on, but uh, in terms of you know reading our Bibles, but uh, we our our knowledge of church history is either isn't there or it's terribly uh, inaccurate and skewed. And um, yeah, I think, I think uh, many, many times the, the version of church history that sometimes is at a, you know, being perpetuated at a popular level uh, is more the view of, of the radicals mm-hmm. uh, of the 16th century than the reformers. Though ironically individuals think they're just being, you know, reformers right. <laughs> in truth they're not um the, the reformers of 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 the 16th century um they they very much condemned the radicals who said that well everything's been dark ages uh in in the medieval period especially uh, they some of them went so far some of these radicals went so far as to you know jettison even the church fathers right well uh, the reformers were so frustrated with that because that gave 
uh, credibility to Rome's accusation. Oh, see, we knew we knew you were novel. We knew you were you were heretics. We knew you were innovators, and it put the reformers in a very difficult spot. And they had to say, actually, no, we're not them. We're not radicals. Um, our we, we are actually quite reliant. And this is why uh, you, you have individual, like so many, I, I think it's come to light, there are just so many. You actually look at uh, good historians, they, they've recognized this for a long time, whether it's Martin Bootser or Peter Martyr Vermigli or later individuals like John Owen, um, they did not think of the past as the Dark Ages. Uh, in fact, you know, they were actually very reliant. I mean, Calvin is ex- ex- very indebted to someone like Bernard and um, John Owen is extremely indebted to someone like Thomas Aquinas. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that they didn't have any disagreements. They did, uh, but they did not have this shrunken, very narrow, what I would call a fundamentalist view of history um, that actually is not, it's not Protestant at all. And it's, it actually betrays uh, what it means to be Protestant. And dare I say what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. Mm. Well, that, that kind of leads me to a, a, another question I wanted to ask you. You know, we're, we're, we've, we've talked about this and, you know, we started with, well, what are the, the common problems or mistakes that people in the pew make when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity? But what in your mind are, are, is the biggest theological confusion that you see taking place among theologians? And by theologians, mm. I mean more specifically among evangelical, conservative you know, even Calvinistic, uh, yeah. you know, authors, uh, podcasters, you know, platformers, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever. You know, there are there are people out there um, that that well, there's a lot of debate, right? There's a lot of debate out there on this doctrine. But what is the or what are one a couple of the the top issues that are creating confusion among you know theologians? Uh, today that that some of us are seeing play out on social media. Oh man, there's so many. Uh, I, I, well, we mentioned one of them already and I mentioned that doctrine of eternal generation. I mean, it is baffling when you go back and look at the last 20, even 30 years, how major evangelicals are just, it, it, out of the biblicist mindset, they are just abandoning eternal generation mm-hmm. or if they are affirming it, they don't really understand it properly. Um, and this has come to light as, as goodness, I mean, it, it, this is really at the very definition of what it, it should be yeah. to be orthodox. Uh, I mean, to, to reject uh, a key component of the Nicene Creed, like eternal generation. I don't even um, understand, like, how, I mean, I, I know this is going to, this is going to sound mean, and I'm, I try, we try not to be mean. How do you write an, an, an orthodox, well, it, it's not at this point, but how, how do you write a systematic theology that is heralded by so many when you deny eternal generation? You know, like Grudem, like, yeah. you know, it, it, he eventually came back and he's like, oh yeah, my bad. But it's like, bro, that like this is like super foundational stuff that the church yeah. has maintained for centuries. So like, yeah, I, that's really concerning. Yeah, I think it's revealing. Uh, I think it reveals that we don't, really feel like there is, and we, we, we don't really feel like we have to be accountable um, to something like the Nicene Creed. We can take it or leave it. Um, that, again, that is a very modern mindset, one that would have just been shocking uh, to the church of the past. Um, and it, it also reveals a very deep-rooted biblicism that if I think that, well, you know, I just believe the Bible, well, then I can dispense with um, anything and everything. Um, and that, I think, is occurring. Um, th- th- that's exactly you know what, what's been happening. Uh, even when eternal generation has been, like you mentioned with Grudem, where he comes back and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to affirm eternal generation now. It's still not in yeah. the way that um, the Nicene Creed does, mm-hmm. yeah, as much as he might say, it, say so. Um, and one of the big reasons for this is there has been um, a number of individuals who have taught what's called EFS. Uh, sometimes you'll hear different you know, acronyms for it, ESS, E-R-A-S. Essentially, this is the, the, the view of, uh, this, this is a view that teaches that the sun is actually uh, functionally subordinate, uh, not just 
in the incarnation, but actually within the imminent life of God. Mm-hmm. So the Son, as Son, um, is, is you know what defines the Son as Son. What defines the Father as Father? Well, language has been used to say, well, the Father is a greater authority, even a greater glory than the Son, mm-hmm. and um, th- this is actually this is this is definitive. Uh, this is what makes them father and son. Well, this goes back to some of the problems we mentioned at the beginning of, you know, we are projecting um, some of our own assumptions about what is a person, what is it, what is a society look like? We're projecting a lot of that back into the Trinity, in this case, hierarchy. I think the dangerous thing that we also need to recognize is that, um, and this is not new, I mean, this has been kind of the story of the modern era, is that whenever you go the direction of a more social understanding of the Trinity, uh, naturally individuals start to use that social Trinity for any numbers of uh, you know, number of uh, social agendas. I mean, you see mm-hmm. modern theologians doing this everywhere, wh- whether it's you know politics or the environment. Evangelicals though don't realize they're actually doing the same thing over gender debates. Yeah, and so they start using hierarchy in the Trinity to say, well, they're, that that then is the ace card for you know, you know uh, a, a type of uh, hierarchy in in marriage or the church. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, to answer your question, this is one of the reasons uh, why I think there's been so much misconception over the Trinity, because for decades it was, it was just taught, oh, this is just Bible. You know, if you're a real complementarian, this is what you believe. Uh, if you're a real Trinitarian, this is what you believe. And I think, you know, over time folks have realized, actually, that's completely inconsistent, mm-hmm. uh, not just with Scripture, but, but with what Orthodox Christians have confessed for you know, the majority of history. Um, I would say there's there's maybe uh, uh, something else. Now, I, granted, this is a bit more philosophical and theological, but I think it's also there. Um, there te- and we haven't talked about this in, in our discussion so far, but there tends to be a bit of uh, suspicion. Some, some, some will just outright reject the simplicity of God. And so yeah. in the title of my book, I, I didn't just call it, you know, the Trinity. Mm-hmm. I called it Simply Trinity. Um, simplicity doesn't mean that God is simple to understand. <laughs> right, right. Um, it doesn't mean that he's simplistic. Rather, it's an old word, uh, an old theological word that's extremely important. It means God is without parts. Uh, it, it, there's not just one God, but but God actually is one. And we see this in the biblical uh, witness. Whenever it describes God, you know, it might say yeah. God is love or God is holy. Well, that's very different from us. Uh, you know, you and I were compounded of parts. Mm-hmm. We're very divisible. We're very changeable creatures, but that's not true of God. Well, when we translate this over into the doctrine of the Trinity, this is incredibly important because we're not, we don't want to think of the three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, as different parts. Um, they're not autonomous, separate, divided individuals. Um, Wait, rather, not, are you saying uh, it's, it's not a pie? It's not a clover? I don't know. It's not a pie. <laughs> no, no okay. and 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 I know this sounds silly, but even in um, a lot of that controversy over you know uh, EFS, um, it th- that view does tend to treat God that way. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you insert hierarchy in God, you start to ask the question: Well, is one person greater? Is one person mm-hmm. less? Uh, well, clearly, your your doctrine of simplicity just you know walked out the back door at yeah. that point. <laughs> so. Um, simplicity is incredibly important. I mean, one easy way to understand this, because I know it's a, a difficult doctrine to wrap our minds around. You know, we were talking about John's gospel and what does it mean for the son to be, you know, begotten from the father? Uh, you know, the Nicene Creed uh, loves to speak of, of, of this doctrine. It says the only, we confess, you know, one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God. And then it says begotten from the father before all time, mm-hmm. light from light. This is b- very biblical language. Yeah. True God from true God yeah. begotten, not created of the same essence as the father. So this is really revealing because on the one hand, this, uh, this doctrine of eternal generation, it distinguishes the son as son at the same time, though, according to the Nicene Creed, it also preserves the equality of the son with the Father. And so immediately we have to say, contrary to something like EFS, yes, the Son is begotten of the Father, but He is not less. Uh, he is not less in any way. He, the, the one essence, will, power, and glory, well, Father and Son have that in common, as, as does the Holy Spirit. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if it's, if it's 
you know, hubris or boredom, but like people people deviating from this concept of God. I just, I, I know it's boredom among, in, in some in the academy. You know, I was just talking to Jordan Stefaniak about this recently that, you know, like I, I'm not a scholar, but I have scholar friends, right? And, um, and so I, I, I've, I've, I, I speak to a lot of them and, and there are, there is a, there's a, a large cadre of scholars who immediately sort of poo poo a view because it is traditional or historic. It's like, oh, well, that, you know, that's the, that's the traditional view. Like, oh, absolutely. You know, like, let's just and, like, get rid of that. Like you're bored with the traditional view because why be, because it's traditional and you're trying to, you know, write a thesis. Like, like it's, it's really alarming to me when like Christians, like people that they'll be Bible believing Christians, they love Jesus, you know, uh, but they've they've somehow maybe it's a combination of of, of arrogance and and boredom or or innovation. I, I don't I'm not sure what it is. Well, push you know, back I, against. I this. experienced this. Yeah, you know, I experienced this um, in my own educational journey. Um, it, it was almost as if betraying uh, betraying Christian orthodoxy was almost at times a, a badge that you were being you were you were being biblical. And, uh, uh, and, and that, that kind of, you know, settled it. This is one of the reasons why, you know, at the very beginning of my book, and I do this in class all the time. <laughs> uh, in fact, I do this day one, you know, Christian theology, systematic theology one, day one, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear me talk about humility. Um, mm. it, we tend to think of humility as something that, oh, that's part of the Christian life. And that's something that, you know, part of discipleship and, and a Christian, you know, part of the Christian virtue, and uh, but actually, um, humility is indispensable for theology, and this is why, this is why uh, someone like Augustine, when someone asked him, well, "What does it mean to be heretical, or what does it mean to be heretic?" he actually said, "It means it's a stubborn persistence and error," hmm. uh, which is a re- really different from the way we define. It. We yeah. just think, "Oh, it means you're you're factually wrong." Well, right. okay, that might be you know one one thing but augustine understands no this there's a spiritual element here it's a stubborn persistence why do i mention this well when it comes to the doctrine of the trinity out of all doctrines of the christian faith goodness don't you think we we may just need a little bit of help uh we (laughs) we may need to stand on the shoulders of others who who have for you know two millennia been reading the scriptures before us been devoting their lives to the scriptures and um have labored through very hard controversies in which they've had to work out uh, the proper language that should be used to avoid heresy. I, mean, I can't help but think of the Cappadocians uh, in the in the fourth century. You know, after the Nicene, the initial Nicene Creed, um, they have to start working out how does language work and what language should we use to avoid misunderstanding. Well, this is this is huge. Uh, this is huge. So that by the time you get to uh, Constantinople and the Nicene Creed we have today, well, it, this is all because of their hard work. And so, all that to say, I really advocate that we take a page uh, from history. We we be humble. We we should be humble, and by such humility, we don't come to either scripture or history as if we're going to hold off on our faith until. Are, we're satisfied with our understanding. Quite the opposite. Um, some one of the best theologians, Anselm, put it the opposite way and said, "No, we come out of faith, and that faith then seeks understanding." Mm-hmm. Well, that requires a posture of of true humility. Oh man, that's that's great. That's probably a, a good way for us to wrap this up. I, I want to respect your time and we're running out. Um, I, we wanted to talk about seminary. Maybe I, maybe if you've got time, you can come back on and we'll talk about seminary, uh, the the values, the pitfalls uh, and all of that. I'm a big advocate of seminary uh, and you know I loved my time at Southern and uh, but I, I love what's going on at Midwestern. I'm so glad that you were there. Uh, Dr. Barrett, if people want to follow you online, are you on the social medias? Are you doing the Twitter? Are you doing all that stuff? <laughs> yes, I'm doing the Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you can easily find me. Um, you can find me at Matt M. Barrett uh, on social, on Twitter. Uh, you can also, uh, I, I'm the editor of Credo, 
uh, credomag.com, and we have so many exciting things happening there. I do my own podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I talk to other theologians about all kinds of issues, uh, some, some key theological issues I think both lay people, pastors, and even scholars need to, to be thinking about today. And then we also have um, a, a, an online um, magazine that releases, and so it's built around different topics. And so uh, coming up this year, uh, well, we have some, some really good topics coming. Uh, we're going to have a whole issue devoted to the beatific vision. Mm. Another one, believe it or not, devoted to Thomas Aquinas. What can Protestants learn from Thomas Aquinas? And so yeah. listeners can go there and find all kinds of uh, good theological articles to help them um, help them think more theologically. Yeah, you just did an episode on Thomas Aquinas uh, on the podcast, right? That's right. Uh, Reformed theologian Mike uh, Mike Allen and I uh, got together and said, hey, we're both Protestants, right? Uh, we're both Reformed, right? And and so why is it that, uh, I, you know, you, you actually find some things to benefit from? <laughs> it's because, you're, it's because so, you're closet Catholics, you heretics. And, oh, it must uh, be. Yeah, yeah obviously. Must be. <laughs> I, saw, I saw those book recommendations in your bookstore, you, I mean, oh my gosh, dude! I mean, seriously, uh, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm hard to do to scholarship these days. <laughs> well, man, I read. Okay, whatever. Uh, that is, it, we we're out of time. I don't want to. I don't want to start ranting. Um, man, we are so appreciative of of you and uh, your work, your writing. Uh, Credo Magazine is great. Well done. Uh, that's hard to pull off. You know, Legionnaire has always done a great job with their. Their, mm. their production, their quality, yeah. the graphics and all of that. Man, Credo Magazine looks great, reads great, great resource. Uh, we'll have all of this linked in the show notes, guys. If um, Listen, if you guys uh, want to get in on this stuff, then definitely uh, you know, follow uh, Dr. Barrett online, but pick up his book, uh, the most cleverly titled book on the Trinity ever, uh, <laughs> Simply Trinity. Uh, it, it, it's beautiful. You'll catch on it as you read it. Um, subscribe to his podcast and uh, and check out Credo Magazine. And if you're looking for a seminary, be sure to check out Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary right here in the Midwest where uh, the best people on the planet live. If you want to engage with us, uh, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Doc and Devo. You can visit our website, DoctrineAndDevotion.com. Uh, if, listen, if you want some merch, you want T-shirts, the Spurgeon signature, any of our custom graphics, go to JoeFoStore.com. And if you want to support the podcast and help us to do more of this, you can become an all-access subscriber. You can just scroll down on your podcatcher, look for the Support This Podcast link, click it, and you can sign up right there. Or you can go to doctrineanddevotion.com slash all access. We appreciate all of you for listening and those of you who subscribe. Thank you for helping us pull this off. Dr. Barrett, thanks for coming on. We hope you come, come back sometime soon. Thanks for having me and so encouraging to join you. Mm-hmm.